what's a question that you've been constantly asking yourself recently? Hmm. Hmm. I'm thinking about the Sedona method. It's something that I've applied to my life. And it's really a series of questions. It's not really a method. Uh, a guy named Hale Dwodskin wrote this book called The Sedona Method. And it's a series of questions that are worth asking about letting go. Mm. And fundamentally, I've embodied it now, so I don't even have to ask the questions anymore. But fundamentally, it starts with, you know, can I let this go? Am I willing to let it go? When will I let this go? And sometimes, and these are genuine questions. It's not just like, oh, can I let this go? Of course I can. Well, sometimes you can't let go right now. You think about it literally. If you're rock climbing and I'm holding on to a rock for dear life, no, I can't let this go right now. But can I let go of it soon? Yeah. Okay. Am I willing to let it go? Ooh, that's a more difficult question, isn't it? Am I actually willing to let this go? Because what are the implications of letting this go? Letting go always has implications, right? It's not as easy as simply letting go. I was like, what does that mean for my life? Letting go of my corporate career? Oh, that was so much more than just leaving a, a job, putting in your two weeks notice or whatever. Leaving a corporate career is like, oh, wait a minute. I'm also letting go of my identity. What else am I letting go of here? My identity is so wrapped up in this. Oh, what am I going to replace that with? Do I need to replace that with anything? Do I need to have that facade of an identity? Do I need to have a job title? Also, what can I carry forward from this that actually does serve me? I don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And so can I let this go? And if so, when am I going to let it go? How long am I willing to cling to this? How long am I, long, how long am I going to continue to suffer? How, am I going to, how long am I going to get dragged by the things that I continue to cling to? If I don't want to get dragged anymore, then well, I can simply let go. But the obverse of that is sometimes you need to hold on, and it's okay as well. Letting go of everything, that's called Spartanism. It's actually a mental illness. And um, that's not me denigrating mental illness. I mean, it's a legitimate mental illness that people can't hold on to anything. And that becomes a different kind of problem. And so it's appropriate to understand, appropriate for me at least, to understand how long do I need to hold on to this? Hold on as long as it serves me. And if I'm not willing to let go, then do I even have any freedom or any choice in any of this anyway? Because I'm going to get taken in whatever direction the thing is that I'm holding on to. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny that you speak so much about letting go because I'm literally reading the book, Letting Go by David Hawking as we speak. Um, and I had it right beside me. And as you were saying that, I'm thinking I'm, I'm halfway through this. And so many of the questions that you just asked were in this book and it's, they're so powerful to ask, but I think that we don't like, we don't want the answer. So we don't ask the questions. It's and funny you brought that up. I, I started that book yesterday. No way. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is a, it's a great book. I have power versus force on my bookshelf over there as well from David Hawking. And it's a, it's a, the questions are, are really so, so powerful. It seems like for for you, I know that there was a moment in time, I think it was 2009, when um, your mother passed away and your marriage ended in the same month. And it must have obviously been a, a really a difficult time and you, you had to let go of a lot of things during that time. How has that uh, that ability, that strength to be able to let go evolved over time I and mean, i feel that that's a, it's a a pivotal point for for you for sure yeah that's the hardest time to let go you feel like you want to grab on and hold on to anything you can as your whole world is being uprooted right my uh my mother died my marriage ended both in the same month and i yeah i started looking around and questioning everything that i put all of my effort my skills my time my attention my money into and i realized like oh man, I'm holding on to a lot of things that don't serve me. And so you start to ask questions like, why have I been so discontented? Uh, who is the person I actually want to be? Who, who's the person I want to become? Because it's not the person that I am right now. Yeah. And, and also, what, what things have I been handed that I don't want to keep carrying for other people? It could be judgments. It could be 
pride. That's a big one. You know, um, man, I used to, I don't even, that, that word anymore. Like my daughter does something that is impressive. I don't say I'm proud of you, right? I learned this also from Hale Toad Skin that if you, if you're proud about something, it says something about like, I don't think you'll be able to do that again. And so it makes sense to, oh yeah, your four-year-old son ties his shoes for the first time. Okay, I'm, uh, I get, it's, I'm impressed by you, but James, if, you, if I told you I tied my shoes this morning and you were like, oh, it's, I'm so proud of you, I, w- I would feel so belittled by that, right? Because yeah. like what you're saying is, I don't think that you can do that again. And it's weird. It's, uh, and you look at different mystic tra- traditions, including Christianity, and you can, you can look at you know, pride as being a sin. And it's like sort of the one deadly sin that we all, um, I don't know, we've, we've almost taken it and turned it into this um, noteworthy. I, I, want other pe- I want to be proud of myself, and I want other people to be proud of me. Um, what, a, what a strange thing. Pride was a prison for me. Being needing to do things that I would be proud of. And I know I've talked about this, and this is something I've really changed my stance on in recent years because I I just don't I don't use that word anymore. I get that people have a different usually if someone says I'm proud of you, they're they're just saying I'm impressed by something you did. Yeah. And I just don't want to cling to this version of me that needs your uh, recognition or your veneration in order for me to be complete. Yeah, it's uh I appreciate your your vulnerability and your in your openness as well. Um because obviously none of this is a easy easy topic to touch on. I I I find it funny though because I just check I just uh, finished a chapter of pride in this book. <laughs> and it, it and it changed my perspective on pride as well. Um because it is a it What's is a say? What does he say? That ex- yeah. ex- really exactly what you said. It's something to let go of. Uh, I feel like mm. everything in this book is is something to let go of because I, that is the the practice that I think so many of us have is we need to be able to detach. Whether it's our detachment from our idea of ourself or the detachment of how things should be or where we should be. There's there's so many shoulds and things that we attach ourselves to. That's so difficult with letting go of pride and and kind of seeing it through a different lens. How do you recognize whether it's you or y- even your child? How, how do you be able to still see them and recognize them and recognize yourself without coming from that stance. Yeah. I mean, that's what love is to see someone for who they are without trying to change them or manipulate them or convince them or persuade them to actually see them for who they are. And my daughter, Ella does, she's 10 now and she does something that is impressive. Then great. I'm impressed by it. Right. But I also don't cling to that. I don't define her by the impressive, things that she's done. Oh, you ran fast today. Okay, cool. You run fast, but you're so much more than that. You're you're way beyond that. Right. And one of the best things we can do is just see someone for who they are. Uh, Last week, this uh, happened. um, My daughter's boyfriend, some boy she holds hands with occasionally. She's 10 freaking years old. I'm like, what? (laughs) Yeah. Um, He called her one night. uh, It was last Monday night. And said uh, that he wanted to just be friends Hmm. now i could argue with her and say hey ella you're 10 years old you are just friends (laughs) and tell her the way that she feels is wrong but she was really upset by that it was her first uh heartache her first breakup so to speak and the first of many i'm sure and instead of trying to convince her that uh or even worse saying oh don't cry or it's okay. I just witnessed her for who she was. Like, tell me what you're experiencing right now. I'm really sad. And I don't know why I'm sad. Hmm. Okay. And she looks at me, she says, why am I sad? And that opened up a completely different conversation. I talked to her about, well, we get sad or we get angry, we get frustrated, we get upset. Whenever our idea, our worldview doesn't map on to reality. And as soon as we recognize that those two things don't match up, it causes some sort of emotional stir in our lives. And I said to her, you know, my, the one I deal with all the time is anger. And she's like, really? I've never seen you get angry. I said, huh. 
There's a difference between the internal state, and I don't need to batter other people with that emotion. Quite often what happens is I feel angry. Instead of saying, I feel angry, we say, I am angry. Well, that's the same thing as saying, I am anger. Anger is me. And once we identify with that, that's a type of clinging. And of course, when we're clinging to something, now it's going to begin to express itself outwardly. I am anger, so you're going to see my anger, right? But I can also say I'm angry without battering you with that emotion. I can express it. I'm not repressing it or hiding it. If I get upset about something, I can say that I feel upset about this. I feel angry. I feel saddened. I feel displeased. I can say these things. There's often there's no reason to express this to other people. Why do I need to tell the people in Alabama here and Professor Sean is here in the room? I don't need to go to them. And every time that I encounter a perceived negative emotion, I don't need to say, hey, I'm angry right now. I'm sad right now. Quite often they'll see it. They'll intuit it anyway, right? But I don't use those emotions to identify who I am. They're not part of my identity anymore. And also, I don't use those emotions to then lob, lob grenades at the people I care about most. 